I hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting and the fact that I remain seated when I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here for the rest of the show. And I should tell you that I'm backed up by quite a staff of people between here and Menlo Park, where Stanford Research is located, some 30 miles south of here. And uh, if every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting, I think. What you're watching is a moment that uh, changed the world. This is Douglas Engelbart. It's December 9th, 1968, right here in San Francisco. He was a true pioneer. He led the groundbreaking Augmented Human Intellect Research Center at Stanford Research Institute. And on that day, about 50 years ago, Engelbart articulated a set of technologies and a way of thinking that we are only now, nearly 50 years later, beginning to realize. The research program that I've going to describe to you is quickly characterizable by saying, if in your office, you intellectual worker, were supplied with a computer display, backed up by a computer that was alive for you all day and was instantly responsible, responsive, <laughs> instantly responsive to every action you had, how much value could you derive from that? He's about to demonstrate for the very first time word processing, the computer mouse, hypertext, video conferencing, collaborative real-time editing, dynamic file linking, version control, and much more. It's what they call the mother of all demos. But more important than any specific feature or application was a new way of thinking. That way of thinking replaced what we had previously thought as the purpose of computers, computing, with something brand new. Those things we use to tabulate the census or to calculate the trajectory of surface-to-air missiles or write accounting entries to a ledger and perform arithmetic, those things could be a whole new class of tools. One that could augment human intellect, help us communicate, organize, share, and store knowledge. Of course, it was also very basic. Before we could even begin to fulfill that vision, there was a lot of work to do. And made a shopping list. So uh, <laughs> it's got quite a few items on it. And if I want to, I can see that, yes, those are numbers, numbered statements. And I can say there are ways I can scan down it, like I can point to 10 and say put it at the top. And I scan up and point to 23, and I got quite a few. And I remember that's about as far as it got when she said, well, call me back when you're ready to go shopping, and I'll tell you the rest of the things. So let me jump back to the head of the list, and I can do things like begin to reorganize it a little bit. Well, I say after bananas, it's more likely that I'll uh, take the carrots there, and so carrots move right up behind bananas, and aspirin doesn't really belong there. Uh, I think aspirin goes so, yeah, after paper towels. Yeah, this was uh, pretty order. basic. But Engelbart was decades ahead of his time. And over time, the basic building blocks were put into place. They were refined, made progressively more powerful and more useful. And these steady improvements were punctuated by a number of pivotal moments. New applications, like relational databases and word processing, allowed us to generalize computing power and apply it to whole new domains. Perhaps the most important single example of this was the first spreadsheet application, VisiCalc. It was released in 1979 and launched in the new, wildly popular personal computer called the Apple II. It was transformative. This was the application that propelled the personal computer to become the essential tool for business. Over the next couple of decades, computers went from being these things which were rare and very expensive to something that you found on the desk of every office worker. The machines themselves rapidly became more powerful, more capable, faster with more memory and better input devices the operating systems improved relentlessly. Waves of new categories of business software were created. ERP, HRIS, CRM, project management, source control, unified communications, accounting systems. As exciting as this movement was, something wasn't right. All this amazing technology wasn't making us more productive. In the old days, you could invest a dollar to buy new equipment for your manufacturing plant, and received several dollars back and increased productivity. That had been true almost since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. But a dollar invested in information technology in 1985 
that returned about a dollar. How could that be? Why, if we had these incredible tools, these bicycles for the mind, which opened up whole new possibilities, which allowed us to do things we could never have done before, why didn't we collectively become instantly more productive? The answers aren't simple, but two big things stand out. First is the internet. In 1992, about halfway between Engelbart's demo and today, I went down to the basement of the Clara Hugh Building at the University of Victoria in Canada I was there to collect the login for the school's Unix system, and I was exposed to the internet for the very first time. My tiny little mind was blown. So the web was still about a year away from prevalence, but there was Usenet, the infinite seeming directory of news groups, there was IRC, there was email, there was the old Unix program Talk, uh, which showed letter by letter what your correspondent was typing live. I could communicate with friends who had gone to colleges on different sides of the country. I could find people all around the world with the same interests as I did. I still remember uh, the first crush I ever had on someone who I had never seen before. This was someone who was like green text on the black background of a VT100 terminal. <laughs> I still remember the first time I ever settled an argument by looking something up on the internet, connected to the US Geological Survey's Gopher server to determine the number of earthquakes of greater than magnitude three each year. And I was right. <laughs> Ever since then, for my entire adult life, I've been absolutely fascinated by this idea of harnessing computing technology to facilitate human interaction. And that was because of the internet. Over the next decades, more and more people began to discover it. As millions and then tens of millions and then hundreds of millions of people came online, it became more and more obvious we were witnessing the dawn of one of the greatest technological advancements since the development of written language. Whatever comes next, I'm certain that we here in this room are the last generation of human beings who will know life both before and after the internet. So this is the first thing we were missing. And you can imagine most of you will have had this experience sometime between 1998 and 2005, where this incredible tool that opened up all these new possibilities that allowed us to do things we had never done before, this bicycle for the mind, became basically a rock, like an inert object if it wasn't connected to the internet. The second thing we needed was, in one sense, much simpler, just figuring out how we would all work together given all these new tools. This is a still from the 1960 Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine movie, The Apartment. It's a great movie, by the way, and uh, I owe Ben Evans and Andreessen Horowitz for both the stills and making this comparison I'm about to make. But this is a couple decades before Brooklyn and Frankston released VisiCalc. And at the time, this is what a spreadsheet looked like. The rows and columns uh, were a worksheet. Every floor of the building composed this giant Excel file. At every desk, you had a person playing the role of a cell in a spreadsheet. Communication between the cells was typewriters and carbon copies, actual carbon copies. And the work was carried out on these electromechanical calculating machines, like the one you see here. So this is obviously a very different way of working than what we have today. Imagine the transformations that happened in how insurance companies like this one operated and every other company between then and now. Think about all the articles that appeared in Harvard Business Review over the intervening decades. The management philosophies, the fads and the real innovations, the best-selling books, the movements for greater agility, flexibility, quality, transparency. This was the second missing ingredient, the changes in the way we work together as teams, which are still going on today. As individuals, the continued innovation and improvements, even just the continued proliferation of business software product categories over the last few decades was making us better, faster, and smarter. But its teams, not so much. Communication is the fundamental human challenge. If you ask any executive what their biggest obstacle is, they will tell you coordination, communication, alignment. Even when we're performing well as individuals, groups are hard and the larger they get, the harder it gets. That's why this is such an exciting challenge. 
So I have some bad news. We haven't completely solved all that today. And I don't want to suggest that this is a moment with the same amount of historical significance as Engelbart's mother of all demos. But the good news is we have made a significant step. Teams all over the world have transformed through their use of Slack. They've changed the way they work. And in a sense, Slack gave those people the equivalent of giving us, as individual knowledge workers at our desktop computers, the internet. It works for teams. But the largest enterprises are not single teams. They are made up of teams. They are intricate networks of overlapping, interconnected teams. And every one of them is different. Today, we're going to show you how Slack can enhance the communication, coordination, and alignment of the largest organizations in the world, just as we have for single teams. So let's get started. Please join me in welcoming our Vice President of Product, April Underwood. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so delighted you've come out to hear a little bit about what we've been working on. So my boss, Stuart, just laid out um, his vision that we all share, that we're in the middle of a multi-hundred year transformation in how people work. So I run product here, so that means we have our work cut out for us. Um, we've, you know, at best got another 50 years or so for us to work on it, but we think we can make a good dent. When we turn to, you know, how do we solve this huge problem? How, how do we help teams of all sizes work together better? We look to our mission. Our mission is to help make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And we're not done with that mission until that works for the employee that works at a company of 10, or a company of 1,000, 10,000, or even hundreds of thousands. We want Slack to work great for teams of all sizes. We want to be the command center for the individual. We want Slack to be the place you go to find the people, that you work with, the information you need to do your job, as well as the tools that help you do it all. We also, across an entire organization, want to be the connective tissue that takes that up a level. It connects teams to one another. It connects projects. And ultimately, it harnesses the power of all the information and tools at a greater scale. And we have real work to do to make this work. We started out with smaller teams, and then we started seeing something interesting. Larger companies were really showing demand to use Slack. And they were adopting it in an interesting way. They were typically adopting it in these pockets. So you'd see multiple teams around an organization using Slack and getting the benefits, each of them using Slack in their own way. The sales team might have a bot to be able to pull up account information, and the engineering team might have tools that they use to be able to deploy code. These tools were being used, and Slack was being used in these silos, which actually created a real challenge, which is that people wanted to do their work in Slack. They wanted Slack to be where they got work done, which is why we say Slack is where work happens. So we, we realized we had a design challenge, which is that we wanted to be able to make Slack continue to offer that flexibility to allow the engineering team to work the way it wants to and the sales team to work in different ways. But what was happening is they were having to fall back to using email or other communication tools when they really would have preferred to work with each other with Slack. So when those teams wanted to work together, we needed to introduce a new product. So this design challenge, how do you balance flexibility for teams with a desire to be able to offer wall-to-wall -wall communication for organizations of tens or hundreds of thousands of people? How do you offer CIOs the control and the oversight that they need while offering teams the autonomy and the ability to tailor their use of Slack to their own team's needs? And so our solution is to connect these teams together. And rather than thinking of these as individual teams, because what is a team? Teams can be regions, business units, uh, product teams. They can change from week to week or month to month. Instead, these are actually workspaces, and they can be connected with a new product that we're very delighted to announce today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Slack Enterprise Grid. It's something we've been working on for quite some time. And as part of that, I'm very, very pleased to invite to the stage 
our head of enterprise products, Ilan Frank, and he's going to show you the product. <laughs> Slack Enterprise Grid is a culmination of over 500 months of an effort to bring the power of Slack to the largest organizations in the world. Slack Enterprise Grid is a brand new product. Slack Enterprise Grid is a platform to advance productivity at companies of 500 to 500,000 employees. Now, to make this happen, we developed many new features. I'd like to tell you about several of them today. First, we re-architected Slack so you have an unlimited number of workspaces that interconnect. Each workspace is a collection of channels, apps, and members for focused work. The fact that you have an unlimited number of workspaces allows you the flexibility to structure Slack the way that your organization is structured. Now, to bring all those workspaces together, we did several things. First, an organizational-wide employee directory. So every employee in your company can search across all those workspaces instantly, find and connect with their colleagues. Also, we have a new channel type called a shared channel. This channel links two or more workspaces together. This channel can span the entire organization for use cases such as an announcements channel, a help channel, or one to share best practices, or it can connect a certain number of, uh, of workspaces together for functional work. And we have universal search that searches across all of those workspaces. So you can find all content everywhere, and no longer do you have to ask, on which team did I put that document? Now, when we went out and talked to CIOs and IT leaders, they were very clear that they wanted a centralized place to manage and control Slack in their corporations. So we built a new administration dashboard that allows you to do that. However, when we talked to IT team admins in those same large organizations, they were clear that they wanted their teams to remain autonomous. Each team has an identity where work is done. And so this is important. In Slack Enterprise Grid, a team is more than just a folder with nested channels. Team admins continue to set policies and settings, but now they inherit from the organizational rules. And finally, in Slack Enterprise Grid, we've introduced advanced security controls like data loss prevention and e-discovery that are compliant with even the strictest corporate governance rules. Uh, did I mention it supports up to 500,000 employees? <laughs> with Slack Enterprise Grid, we aim to bring humanity back to the workplace. And I'd like to show you a demo, but before we begin, I have to invite onto the stage Leah Jones, who leads our engineering team that built Slack Enterprise Grid. Good to see you. I'm so happy to be here today. We built Grid for large companies, organizations of tens or hundreds of thousands of users. Grid supports employees in finding focused work within their own workspaces while still being able to collaborate, message, and find expertise across the entire organization. In today's demo, Ilan and I both work at the Acme organization, where we build flying umbrellas. I'm a salesperson living in New York. Wait. Let's make this a little more real. I gotta look nice for my customers. <laughs> In fact, it's the afternoon. I just came back from a customer meeting. It was a good meeting. <laughs> it's 
And you can see on the left my workspace in Slack. In sales, we've actually been using Slack for about a year now. And I'm a developer, finishing up a stand-up in our San Francisco office. As you can tell from the charming Legos <laughs> and my Rubik's Cube. <laughs> I work on Acme R&D, and we've been using Slack for about two, two and a half years now. We use it to share ideas and work together to build Acme's latest products. However, when we want to collaborate with our sales colleagues, we have to resort to email, to in-person meetings, or to conference calls. Those were tough times. But fortunately, we recently migrated to Enterprise Grid. We brought all of our teams together, and we still have our individual workspaces. On the sales team, I still collaborate with my sales and marketing colleagues in order to answer customer inquiries quickly and bring our, our flying umbrellas to market. For example, we have channels like the Sales Leads channel that powers a micro workflow that brings leads automatically from our website and where our colleagues can highlight their connections and their account history with each one of these accounts. Another example is the Sales Team channel where our sales team connects with information from Salesforce and from Google Docs for motivation and productivity. Whereas on my R&D workspace, which you can see on the right, engineering, design, and product work closely together. With this separate workspace, we're able to work the way that we want to. For example, we have a triage channel. This channel allows us to quickly track and respond to new customer issues in near real time. As you can see, one of our product managers has reported a new issue. She's noted that our Flying Umbrella's batteries lose charge when they get wet. Obviously kind of an issue for our company. To respond to this, I'm going to add a bug emoji to this message. What this will do is automatically file this in our bug tracking system for later triage, uh, prioritization, and subsequent engineering work. Another workflow that we use on R&D is our DevOps alerts channel. In this channel, we can monitor and respond to critical system issues using integrations such as PagerDuty. This is great. We each have our workspaces for focused work. Those noisy eng channels and bots are nowhere to be found in my sales workspace. And my noisy friends from sales are nowhere to be found in mine. <laughs> At the same time, as a salesperson, I want to share product ideas with Leah and her team. For this, Slack Enterprise Grid gives me a new channel type called a shared channel that connects multiple workspaces together. Here in the Great Ideas channel, you can see that it's shared by the circles next to the name. We connect together, and I can bring ideas that I'm hearing in the field. I just mentioned I was with Globex, one of our largest customers, and while it was a good meeting, they did mention that our umbrellas are slightly unstable in stormy weather. I post that to the channel, and Leah and her team can see it instantly. Now that I have access to this information, sales and engineering can work together to figure out what to do. Before I do that, I'd love to reach out to the customer for more details. Elaine, could you share their contact details in channel? A simple question like this could have been complicated before Enterprise Grid. We would have had to resort to email, logging into enterprise applications. But now what we have is we've rolled out a bot onto the sales team that the sales team has access to and is in the shared channel. I can simply type in the company name and the account information, the contracts, the order forms, and the service requests from our ERP system is available to me. Once I select the account information button, that relevant information is brought back from the ERP system and placed in channel and shared with Leah, as you can see. This is great. I can now reach out to the customer and get the information that engineering needs to fix this. We've been working on a new prototype propeller design, which we think will increase the umbrella's stability. I'm going to create a new channel inside the R&D workspace where we'll work to build this. 
as you can now see, engineering, design, and product management are collaborating to bring this to market. As we start to get closer to shipping, I'm going to need to work with Sarah, who's on our technical writing team, to develop documentation and help content for this new feature. However, Sarah's not in the R&D workspace. Before Grid, I would have needed to use email or reach out to her uh, via phone or, again, call a meeting. With Grid, this is not a problem. I can search and message anyone in my whole organization. I've now reached out to Sarah and asked her to join us on this project. In an ideal world, I would love to be able to invite her to this channel to be able to share the content that we've already developed and identify the team members that she'll need to work with on this project. With Grid, this is not a problem. I can simply share this channel with the writer's workspace and then simply invite Sarah to the channel. With Grid, Slack is truly where work happens across all of Acme. Thank you very much, Leah. It's it was an pleasure. amazing experience building Slack with your team. <laughs> Slack Enterprise Grid is already deployed at our largest customers. You will hear from two of them later today. But already at these customers, IT can set policies across the entire organization using that new organizational dashboard. At the same time, teams remain autonomous, they have their own identity, and they can continue to set local policies that now inherit from those organizational policies. Employees have an unlimited number of workspaces that give them the flexibility to self-organize, and they connect between those workspaces with an organizational-wide employee directory, shared channels, and universal search that spans all corporate knowledge. With Slack Enterprise Grid, employees at large companies can now have simpler, more pleasant, and more productive lives. Thank you very much. I would like now to welcome our next speaker. He's a heavy hitter with a deep history and passion for enforcing corporate compliance. I'm frankly a little bit terrified of him. He's our Chief Security Officer, Jeff Belknap. <laughs> All right, well, I see my reputation's preceded me. That's good. So I joined Slack about a year ago from Palantir, where I got to work on some of the world's hardest data security problems. And during the last year here at Slack, we focused on working with our customers closely and understand what matters most to them. So we took all of that feedback, we prioritized the highest impact areas, and we got to work. And I've been really lucky to work with such an awesome security team. We've achieved so much in the last 12 months. One of the first things that we focused on was working to build the foundations for trust with our customers. And we've done this by aligning our security program to clear industry-recognized standards that our customers not only appreciate, but help them meet their requirements as well. So let's take a look at some of this. And because I have the opportunity to share the stage with the Sutter Street Quartet, I'm going to see if they'll help me out. You guys be my, the roots to my Fallon? Yeah. All right, let's go. Yeah. So CSA, fantastic. This is the Cloud Security Alliance. We joined in early 2016, and we've met their level one standard. We've made exhaustive data on our security and, uh, practices and controls available on their website for anyone to review. SOC 2. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> the type one is the new industry standard audit report for cloud security providers, or for cloud, cloud providers, covering their security and operational controls. The SOC 2 type two, <laughs> it's just like the type one, but it's a little bit typier. <laughs> You're welcome, yeah. Uh, but this goes a step further where our auditors actually set out to figure out if our controls actually do what we say they do, which is pretty important. And then we have the SOC 3. This is fantastic. 
this is another third-party audit control, but everything, unlike the other ones, is boiled down to just the basics. So this means anybody, even if you're not an expert in security risk and compliance, can take a look at this report, see what we're doing, and make a decision for yourself. And for our federal customers, we've mapped our controls to NIST. And we've already been, <laughs> we've already been granted the authority to operate in several federal agencies. And then Privacy Shield. So we really want everyone to be able to use the enterprise product, as many people as possible. So we took the step, the extra step of self-certifying here so our EU customers can understand and have a pretty clear expectation of how we're going to safeguard and protect their data. All right, thanks, guys. All right, so that's the great work we've been doing in our audit, risk, and compliance merit badges. In addition to all of this, we've got some great security features for enterprises old and new. In early 2016, we finished rolling out data encryption in transit and at rest to our entire production fleet. And to help unify authentication across your entire enterprise, we've got SAML-based single sign-on. And for organizations with large workforces, we can automate your onboarding and offboarding with full support for skim provisioning and deprovisioning. We also have fantastic granular app management. This gives you full control to consistently manage your apps and integrations across all of your workspaces. And to aid in managing your legal requirements, customers can set custom data retention settings across the enterprise all the way down to your workspace and channel level. So these features, merit badges, and audit reports are some of the things that have mattered most to our largest enterprise customers. And it's enabled us to work with some of the largest, most secure customers. And all of this is already available today. But now we're going to double down on that progress for enterprise. One of the most common things we get asked about from our enterprise customers is to help them not only use Slack in a small way, but use Slack in a big way, even in the most onerous compliance environments. So to help with that, today we're launching our brand new e-discovery and data loss prevention APIs. So with these, grid customers can implement comprehensive data loss protection policies and controls and e-discovery capabilities right into their Slack workspaces. And to help with this, we've built partnerships with industry-recognized experts in data loss prevention and e-discovery. These partners can help you take tooling that you already have and extend it into the grid. Obviously, you can choose to roll out e-discovery uh, e or DLP integrations based on your industry or internal requirements but you also have the flexibility to come to expect from Slack to choose where and how you implement these integrations. So one last thing. We're not kidding around about this enterprise stuff. We really mean it. We want as many people as possible to be able to use Slack to collaborate on their hardest problems, even in the most stringent data protection environments. So we want doctor's offices to large hospitals, financial services institutions to local bank branches. Customers have told us they really, really, really want to use Slack everywhere in the enterprise. So we listened and we got to work on that too. So today we're announcing that Slack Enterprise Grid is fully FINRA and HIPAA compatible. So we're excited about this enabling healthcare organizations to collaborate on patient outcomes and financial services organiza organizations to be able to collaborate across business units, even in the confines of their heavily regulated environment. So when we're not stopping there, in 2017, we've, we fully expect to complete our ISO 27000 certification and to complete our FedRAMP ATO. We really think this opens up the possibilities of Slack in the enterprise. And we're really proud of what we've accomplished. And I'm really excited about what's to come. And I hope you are too. Thanks. So now to hear more about this and what you can do with a platform like this, I'm going to introduce our head of platform marketing, CC Stalsman. <laughs> We have a saying, Slack is where work happens. But what makes this true is our platform. Our platform brings the tools you use for work into one place. And today, as we launch Enterprise Grid, we know that our platform could not be more important. Because integrating Slack with your existing tech stack is critical to our success. And that's because we're in the golden era of enterprise software. There are thousands of productivity tools readily available to help us get the job done. But all of this good choice creates a problem. 
Our brains want to stay focused on the real work, but we end up getting lost in the context switching and the fragmentation of our tools. The ultimate victim is our productivity. With our platform, we bring the high-frequency, low-effort tasks into Slack, where you're already working. Slack isn't consuming other products, it's improving your experience with them, giving them a new place to meet you in your work stream. Notifications, approvals, reports, alerts shouldn't require jumping out of your flow. Processes that take 10 steps take two steps in Slack. Now, there are two main ways that you can use our platform, as I've just described. The first is with a custom integration, and the second is with our ecosystem of apps. With our APIs, your developers can connect Slack with any internal system or workflow. This is what we call a custom integration. Many of our large customers, like Electronic Arts and Autodesk, rely on custom integrations today. At one of the world's largest retailers, the IT team has built a custom integration bot. This bot brings their help desk ticketing system into Slack. It's already helped them respond to tens of thousands of tickets. And in their own words, ticketing used to take three to four minutes per, but in Slack, it now takes milliseconds. The custom integration has become indispensable to their team. On top of custom integrations, we have a robust and rapidly growing ecosystem. We launched our platform just over a year ago with 150 apps. And today, we have over 900. What are these 900 apps made up of? Well, to start, there's a new generation of B2B software being built on top of Slack. This is why we have the Slack Fund, to invest in these new transformative products. We've made 24 investments so far in companies like WorkRamp, a training app for learning and development right in Slack. We also had an incredible 2016 and launched over 50 partnerships. Our partners span across all major verticals and include companies like PayPal and Adobe, Box and Google. It truly doesn't matter how diverse or how unified your tech stack is. With our platform, we bring the tools you use for work together so that you can stay focused and get more done. On that note, I have some exciting news. Today, we're announcing a partnership with SAP. In the second half of our program, you'll hear from SAP and Brad Armstrong, our head of business development. But now, I'm going to pass the mic to Noah and Isaiah to talk about the future of Slack with search, learning, and intelligence. <laughs> We're excited today to talk to you about our SLI team's mission to make Slack smarter and your company more productive the more that you use Slack. We've been making major investments in search and machine learning and applying those to Slack so that we can make better sense of all the knowledge within your company and build a work graph of how the people and channels and topics are all interconnected. We'll make it fast to get answers to any question that you might have through search and then, over time, Slack should start to feel like this instantly responsive agent. It helps you focus on reading what's most important first, catch up quickly, and discover conversations you otherwise would have missed. But before we go into all the details of the features, we want to give you a better sense of some of the motivating problems that our team is focused on. So, in an ideal world, all of us knowledge workers sitting here today would probably spend most of our week, you know, coming up with creative new ideas, brainstorming with colleagues at a gratuitously large whiteboard, and moving projects forward. But in reality, we spend so much of our week on the most mundane parts of work. About 30% of our time is spent just keeping up with digital communication. Email is a primary culprit there. And 20% of our time just getting answers to questions internally. So what might that look like with a simple question, like, what is my 401k matching plan? You'd probably start off by asking your manager, who maybe a couple hours later would get back to you and say, I've got to ask my manager. And then a day later, you'd finally hear back the name of the person in HR to talk to. These games of telephone can take hours, if not days, to complete. We want to short circuit that with the work that we're doing here on SLI. You heard Stuart talk about two decades of being able to find pretty much anything you want on the internet, but search in the workspace has lagged far behind. We're fixing that here at Slack. 
We want to augment your ability to get these everyday, boring, mundane tasks done faster so you can go back to doing your best, most creative work with your team. So what does short-circuiting that game of telephone actually entail? We want to give knowledge workers three main superpowers. First, getting instant answers to questions internally, whether the best answer is a relevant message, an expert within your company, an important file, a trending link, or even a third-party integration. Second, we want to help you be able to catch up quickly when you inevitably fall behind and focus on reading the most important things first, directly tackling the problem of information overload. And finally, we want to make sure that you never miss out on an important conversation, giving you a better pulse of what's happening across your entire organization. Over time, this should make Slack feel like an increasingly deep understanding of the people and topics that you care most about. And now, Isaiah is going to walk you through some of the exciting features we have on deck for the year, powered by this foundation. Thanks, Noah. In search, our primary goal is to deliver a fast, personalized, and universal search experience so that people and teams of all sizes can search through their company's collective knowledge. With the work we're doing on SLI, people should spend less time searching for what they need and more time getting things done. Recently, we launched Top Results, a feature that automatically ranks and prioritizes relevant results and places them right at the top of your search pane. It's the start to Slack delivering instant answers to questions through search. In the coming months, we'll be releasing a host of search features to help with our goal. And the first is universal search. This is a unified search experience that delivers not just messages, but relevant results across all types of information. So let's say you search website redesign project. With universal search, instead of just getting messages that match those words, instead, you'll get the people involved on the project, the related files you've all been working on, and channels where the project has been discussed, all in a single set of results. The second feature we'll be releasing is smart filters, which intelligently suggests ways to quickly refine your search and narrow your results to find exactly what you're looking for. The more you use these filters, the better Slack becomes at making suggestions to help you find what you need. OK, so that was search. Now on to how we'll help you focus and catch up. We're working on an intelligent layer in Slack to help you focus on the people, channels, and topics that are most relevant to you. In August 2016, we launched personalized channel suggestions to help you discover new channels central to your work and curate your channel list to manage communication. We've noticed that these suggestions are accepted at an incredibly high rate which shows us that people are looking for more ways to focus their experience in Slack. The first of two upcoming features we'll be releasing to help with focus and catch up is channel highlights. After you've been away from Slack for some time, this feature highlights key unread messages to help you quickly skim and navigate to important messages you might have otherwise missed. And lastly, in the coming months, we'll be releasing daily briefings. This is a single streamlined view of the most important and relevant conversations happening in Slack, so you can quickly catch up and stay up to date on the latest at your company. Imagine coming back to Slack after a vacation or even after a really long meeting, which I know might start to feel like the same thing for some of you, and that's OK. But instead of coming back to Slack and simply seeing the last channel you're in, daily briefing services the most relevant and important information, so you can get up to speed and get back to work. That was just a brief overview of a few features we have coming from the Search, Learning, and Intelligence team in 2017. Thanks, Isaiah, for walking through all of those. I know I'm at least excited to start using them every day. So if we can really deliver on this mission for SLI, then we can actually help realize some of the original vision for Slack, which was actually given an acronym after it was named, of a searchable log of all conversation and knowledge. We can make sense of all the workflows that happen throughout your company, so we can build a work graph for organizations of all sizes, powering an ever more personalized, intelligent version of Slack for everybody at your company. Get instant answers to even the hardest questions built on top of the collective knowledge of your team. Over time, we'll enhance your ability to keep up with all the information that's flowing through Slack. 
Imagine spending 10 minutes catching up when you get back from a business trip instead of probably four hours. Imagine getting instant alerts to the most important discussions happening in real time instead of missing out on critical conversations. Imagine how much time and energy Slack could save you every single day. These features are just the beginning of us making Slack smarter and your company more productive the more that you use Slack. And now I'd like to welcome back our VP of product, April Underwood. Great job. Thanks so much. Let's give a round of applause and thanks to Ilan, Leah, Jeff, Noah, and Isaiah. So you've seen many of the things that we're working on, and more good news is that Slack is already powering many of the largest organizations in the world. A couple of them, which have already been using Slack Enterprise Grid for a while, for the last few months, are here to join us on stage today. So I'm delighted to invite Jeff Smith and introduce Jeff Smith, the CIO of IBM, as well as Jennifer Manry, the Vice President of Workplace Technologies at Capital One. Both IBM and Capital One have been some of our beta customers working closely with us during the last few months on Slack Enterprise Grid, and we're really excited to get to hear from them directly. And in order to facilitate that conversation, I'm going to invite to the stage Pamela Hines, who is a professor at Stanford and the director of the Center for Work, Technology, and Organization. But before that, let's hear from one of our customers in their own words, Udemy, one of the world's largest destinations for online courses. What we're trying to do is build the world's greatest library. So we have 42,000 courses over 80 different languages that about 14 million students can access. So one of the challenges that companies often face is that communication practices that worked well when the company was smaller just stopped working. And I think we started to see some of that at Udemy. We love sharing information and we also love to celebrate and we love to congratulate each other on successes and big wins and the result of that was a lot of email. And as we looked at Slack, we thought there was actually an opportunity to look at Slack not just as a chat tool, but as a productivity platform and fundamentally change the way we worked and communicated here at Udemy. We needed a tool that was multilingual, that was easy to use, and that was very reliable, that allowed us to share a variety of documentation as well as personality. And Slack, more than anything else, solved that problem of giving us a way to emote ourselves in a messaging platform. We're all working so hard to try and build something that's really going to democratize education. And I think Slack lets us work at a pace where we can do that. 